And okay, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Before we get started on today's program, I just want to remind everyone that we will be recording today's session and it will be posted to the library's YouTube page at a later date. Only our presenters will be spotlighted, video will be turned off, and microphones will be muted until the end of the program when we have the Q&A segment. If you have any questions before then, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Thank you for attending today's program on Winter Gardening in California. My name is Yanina Yang, and I'm a librarian with the Willow Glen branch of the San Jose Public Library. Our presenters today will be Carlo Francisco Katambang and Riley Fagan of La Mesa Verde. Today's workshop will cover some of the ins and outs of winter vegetable gardening, specifically focusing on the topics of common cool season vegetables and when to plant them, identification and management of pests and diseases, winter garden maintenance, and as a bonus, you'll learn a recipe that you will use with your cool season crops. Our presenter, Carlo Francisco Katembang, is an experienced gardener from La Mesa Verde, an urban gardening and food justice program based out of Sacred Heart Community Service located here in San Jose. La Mesa Verde is a leadership network of urban gardeners who build access to healthy food in San Jose. Their belief is that by developing collective leadership among their members through producing their own food and organizing for policy change, they can improve access to good food in San Jose and create a strong, sustainable community committed to food justice. To learn more about La Mesa Verde, just go to their website at lamesaverdeshcs.org. And now I'm going to turn it over to Carlo and Riley. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Carlo Francisco Katambang. I'm the Volunteer Network Coordinator at La Mesa Verde. Hi, everyone. My name is Riley Fagan. I'm also the Volunteer Network Coordinator at La Mesa Verde. Um, and I can go ahead and get us started. So here is going to be what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to do a quick introduction to our program. Um, and then Carlo is the gardening expert, so he's going to take over and talk about common cool season vegetables, identification and management of pests and diseases, winter garden maintenance, and then I will hop back on to uh, distribute a fall harvest recipe. So Yanina covered a little bit about our program, uh, but I just wanted to emphasize more. So this is Welcome to La Mesa Verde. Um, we are a really large network of volunteers, mentors, gardeners, members, staff, um, everyone is part of the La Mesa Verde family if they want to be. Um, so we are a leadership network of urban gardeners. Um, this is kind of our mission statement. Um, we recognize that the industrial food production and sale is designed for profit at the expense of our environment, our community, and our health. Um, gardeners with La Mesa Verde challenge this injustice in the food system by producing our own food in a supportive community and by organizing for real changes that improve access to food in San Jose, um, which is an incredible mission statement, but it is a little bit abstract. So kind of just to get a little bit more concrete, um, members of La Mesa Verde are um, empowered to grow their own food. Uh, we provide them with all the resources they need to do that. So we give our members garden beds, soil, seeds, seedlings, um, compost, what else? I think that's it. And then we also do um, monthly workshops and that are centered around um, certain food justice issues and also um, gardening techniques. So, um, and then also our members receive one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship from experienced gardeners. So, uh, and then they also participate in um, collective leadership of committees organizing for change within the program and um, how we can organize our our program and our community to advocate for change in San Jose and hopefully on a greater scale to um, improve this food system. So that is our program. We are based out of Sacred Heart Community Services. They offer a lot of community services um, here in San Jose. So they are our, our host, our parent organization, our everything like that. Um, so these, what 
are what I identified as our three core kind of values or just three points that I really wanted to highlight about our program. Um, so number one is agroecology, um, which means that we recognize ancestral practices of land management and draw on themes of diversity, resiliency, and sustainability, um, both with our people, with our community, and with our plants. So diversity, resiliency, and sustainability apply to both human beings and plants because um, we're all a part of nature and we're all growing and learning um, and applying that as much as we can to our community and our gardens. Um, so next, I wanted to highlight our aspect of community leadership. As I mentioned, our members are very centered in decision making and projects. Um, our members shape the future of LMV. They organize, they let us, they, you know, make changes, they advocate for change. Um, yeah, their, their collective power is really, really impactful in our program, um, and we try to center them as much as possible. Um, and then our theory of change is that we believe that by producing our own food and organizing for policy change, we can improve access to good food in San Jose and create a song, strong, sustainable community which is committed to food justice. Um, our members do feel very empowered by growing their own food. Carlo himself is a member or has gardens with, or was a member at some point before joining the staff. Um, so I'm sure he'll share a little bit more about the personal impact, but um, there is a very real impact um, that our members feel by growing their own food. So then I will pass it off to Carlo from there. Okay, so to the main event. So um, today we're talking about winter gardening in California. And the amazing thing about California compared to the rest of the country is that we're actually able to grow food all year round. We have a very distinctive, cool, and uh, warm season here. Um, the warm season here is between April uh, all the way to September to October. And then the cool season is from September to October from uh, all the way till about uh, March or April. Um, so uh, this is a list of common uh, cool season vegetables that do really well during our cool season here. Um, usually you want to plant these vegetables out in late September or early October, specifically here in zone 9B. You can technically plant it out a month earlier than that. But once again, these plants do like a little bit cooler weather um, for them to get uh, to grow well. Um, they do need enough sun to establish their roots before the days do get shorter and nights get colder. So you have to really weigh the options when it comes to how early you plant these vegetables. And so uh, what the cool season vegetables usually consist of are a lot of leafy greens, immature flowers, uh, and root crops. There's also some herbs and other types of vegetables that you can grow during this time. So in terms of leafy greens, uh, everyone knows kale. Kale is a uh, superfood, very high in nutrients. Uh, it's in the brassica family. Uh, cabbage is another big one that grows really well. You can grow big heads of cabbage during the winter. Uh, Swiss chard is actually one of our favorites in La Mesa Verde. It's one of those vegetables that grow actually year round here. We actually give Swiss chard as a seedling uh, both in spring and in fall because it just grows all year round. The weather is so great that it can grow in both hot and cool weather. Um, and then there's also spinach, um, which grows really fast, uh, really easy to harvest. And then mustard, which is a really resilient plant. Uh, if you have any problems growing your own greens, mustard, if you like uh, spicy greens, mustard is a really good one to grow. It's really resilient, super easy, uh, even to grow from seed. Um, and then there's lettuce, uh, which grows really well in this area too. Um, you can grow either the leaf kind of lettuce or you can grow head lettuce. Uh, okay. In terms of immature flowers, we're thinking about two different brassicas. Uh, so there's broccoli, uh, which everyone's familiar with, the little green trees that you find at the store. Um, and then uh, cauliflower, which are the white head ones, uh, which can be used uh, in making uh, fake rice, 
um, steamed, stir fried, uh, that sort of deal. But those are immature, technically immature flowers, not fruits. Um, and then uh, there are the root crops that you can grow as well. So turnips do really well during the winter here. But they're my personal favorites. Um, and then you can also grow beets if you like uh, to juice. The beets are a really good option when it comes to root crops. And then radishes, uh, there's actually two kinds of radishes. There are spring radishes and winter radishes. Um, technically, the one that you see pictured here are spring radishes that grow really fast. They tend to be very small. Um, those kind you can uh, plant in the early spring and then get a harvest within a month or two. Uh, winter radishes are a little bit bigger. Uh, if you think about winter radishes, you're thinking about like daikon radish, which are those really long, wide, uh, uh, white roots that you would find at the Asian markets. Uh, those ones grow really well during the winter here. Honestly, uh, there was one year where I uh, grew an entire bed of them and uh, I had an abundance of radish at the end of the season. <laughs> radishes grow, grow really well so if you want to do a really easy crop radishes are a big one and then um, in terms of herbs and other vegetables parsley is one herb that we do like growing during the winter it really enjoys the cool weather um, and then scallions which we actually plant both in the winter and uh, in the spring uh, grow really well they can tolerate some cool weather um, Usually it's great to start them off as little seedlings. And then sugar snap peas is a favorite of most members. Uh, they're a trestling kind of plant where you need to make sure it has a structure to climb on. Um, and then you can eat the entire pods if you've ever gotten them to snack on at the market. Uh, they're really healthy for you, a lot of good fiber, um, but they are super easy to grow. Um, and you can usually grow a line of them and have enough sugar snap peas for the entire season. All right. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about identification and management of pests. So in a winter garden, uh, you are not going to experience as much pest and disease compared to the warm season. During the warm season, you have to imagine insects actually like warmer weather. And um, that's why there's abundance of pests during the, win uh, the uh, summer. But once it starts getting cooler, there's only a couple of pests that you really need to worry about because most pre uh, pests go into hibernation during that time. Um, so these are the top three pests that you would have to worry about during the winter uh, that can be very destructive to your plants um, and that can be managed just by simple uh, organic uh, practices. Um, so in terms of management, I am going to go over um, the least, least, uh, let me see, uh, least uh, impactful um, on the environment uh, methods when it comes to management. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about spraying any organic, uh, any organic pesticides during this time. Okay, so the first one in the top left, um, you see a little green worm with two little feelers on the front. Um, these are cabbage worms. Uh, they're actually a white butterfly with a dot, a black dot on their wings when they're adults, but they are very destructive, especially to brassica plants like kale, uh, broccoli, um, any kind of a brassica plant. Uh, they're really attracted to uh, a certain chemical that's in the plant. So, um, you really want to try to discourage having cabbage worms. Once you have them in your garden, they literally explode and um, you have so many in your garden all at once, it can completely devastate your plants. So what we like doing at La Mesa Verde is uh, getting uh, fabric row covers to discourage the cabbage worm adults, which are butterflies, from laying their eggs onto the leaves of these plants. And then when, if you do see these worms on your plants, which tell you the truth, the worms are really difficult to find because they are green like most plants. So you have to really look carefully, especially near the stem of the plant, observe where any of the chewing damage have been. And then if you see them, pick them up. And then if you have a little cup filled with some water and then a little soap, you can drown them in the cup 
that's a more humane way of killing them. Um, that way they don't spread in your garden. They are invasive pests in this area. They devastate crops and local farms all the time. So don't feel bad about uh, taking them out of your garden. Okay, um, but that that's cabbage worms. That's probably gonna be the biggest pest that you will see during this time. Um, okay, next on the list is slugs and snails. So slugs and snails, um, they're both similar in the fact that they leave a noticeable slime trail uh, that glistens in the sunlight during the day. Um, you'll see chewing marks uh, at the edges of plants, around the stems of the plants. If you have fruit sitting on the bottom of the soil, they'll be chewing on the fruit on the bottom as well. Um, so the best way to manage snails and slugs is to go out at night with a flashlight and then uh, pick, uh, flash a light. And if you see any slime trails and you find them, pick them by hand and do the same method when it comes to the cup with soapy water. Um, you can drown them into the, uh, the little cup. Um, you can even squish them too, but personally, I like the drowning method better. Um, and then if uh, you don't wanna go pick by hand, there is a really easy way you can capture them. So if you have a spare can of beer, uh, you can cut the beer can in half, right? Actually empty out the beer can first, cut the beer can in half. You can bury that half of beer can just, uh, just at the surface of the soil. That way they can easily crawl into the can and then fill the can, the can in the soil up with uh, about three fourths full of beer and the yeast of the beer will actually attract the snails and the slugs into the container and they will actually drown themselves uh, going after the beer. So um, that's a really easy way of capturing them without actually having to touch them, um, but putting several beer traps will probably work. Um, and then the next pest that we need to talk about are aphids. So aphids are a problem all year round here. Um, they're tiny pear-shaped insects with a wide range of colors. Uh, from gray all the way to green, there's even some black aphids. And they can have wings and they can not have wings. Um, a good partner for aphids are actually ants. Ants actually farm aphids. Um, they actually pick up the little nymphs, bring them into leaves or the tips of plants. And then they allow them to feed on the uh, basically the juice of the plants. And then the ants actually feed on the uh, dew that the insect excretes from its rear end. Uh, it's basically a sugar solution. So the ants actually uh, farm uh, aphids in order to do that. So whenever you see aphids, you're gonna see uh, ants as well. But uh, you can find them uh, literally everywhere in your winter garden, uh, especially in cabbage, kale, and lettuce plants. Uh, the best way to try to cure them is to create a natural garlic spray. So garlic spray that has onions and garlic soaked in water and then strained and then put in a spray bottle to spray. Um, that can usually deter them from uh, coming back to the pants because they do not like the intense uh, smell and the chemicals in the garlic spray. You can also spray plants with a really strong spray from a water hose. Just be careful not to damage your plants. Um, if you wanna do it by hand, you can actually squish the aphids by hand with your fingers. Um, if there's a lot though, that's, that can be very difficult to do all at once. So either using, either using the garlic spray or a strong spray of water is probably gonna be the most effective way. Um, but yeah, uh, you'll find aphids. You, you kind of have to live with them in your garden, um, but I wouldn't worry if it's only a small amount, but once it starts getting bigger, um, you definitely do need to do some management practices. Um, but yeah, those are the main ones that you wanna look out for. Okay, so these are just some notes on diseases and uh, weeding during winter. So uh, even though you won't get many diseases during the winter, um, Many fungal spores and bacterial diseases and pests overwinter on overwintered plants, uh, dead plant debris, and seeds. So in order to prevent this, you have to make sure you properly dispose of infected plants in the trash 
when cleaning the garden at the end of the warm season. You should never compost pest infested or disease infected plants either. Um, so uh, there, are, there are some people who will try to overwinter their annual crops like their peppers, sometimes even tomatoes will go over the winter, but um, it's about a 50-50 chance on whether or not those plants survive. The negative thing about actually trying to do that is that you're providing an environment where insects can actually overwinter in your crops, whether by eggs or uh, as adults. They hide either in the leaf litter in your soil or to hide in the debris that's in the dead part of the plants. Um, and so uh, when you are cleaning out your garden between each season, um, it is important to try to get rid of as much of the matter as you can uh, if it's infested. Um, you know, some people will choose to compost them, which are fine. Uh, you can compost, but like I said earlier, you shouldn't try composting any diseased parts of plants um, just because uh, that will overwinter and will spread to other plants if you use that compost. Um, and a note on weeding. Uh, because of winter rain during, we have a very a wet winter season usually, um, many cool season weeds actually survive and thrive. So examples would be perennial glasses, grasses like Bermuda grass and crab grass and other uh, weeds such as common mallow, sow thistle, prickly lettuce plantain, chickweeds and yellow wood sorrels. Um, these are all very common uh, weeds that you will find in your garden during the winter. Uh, you have to make sure you remove these weeds, the roots, and even some of the bulbs, for example, yellow wood sorrel will have bulbs in the soil. You have to remove all these, especially while they're small and easy to deal with. If you leave them to grow to adults, they can uh, produce seeds or reproduce asexually, uh, which can be a problem in the future and cause you to have a lot of more work. They say, it's an old saying, saying that if you don't weed once, uh, you'll be weeding seven more times um, in the future, just because uh, you don't nip it in the bud and uh, weed them when they're small. Um, but yeah, weeding uh, in the winter can be a little easy. Plants uh, grow a little bit slower during that time. So you can usually catch weeds when they're little babies. Okay, so uh, winter garden maintenance. So um, I personally like winter gardening in California because it is one of the easiest times to grow vegetables uh, during the year because of less pests and the winter rain. Um, here are a couple of steps uh, for winter garden maintenance. So uh, when you are watering, only water when it's necessary. Uh, water the soil, uh, not the leaves and stem. That way you don't encourage any fungal diseases. Uh, because of the winter rains, you need to make sure you check the top three inches of your soil using your finger um, up to your second, or, uh, second knuckle on your finger. Put your finger into the soil. And then if you feel like it is moist, if the soil is sticking to your hand because of the moisture, Usually that means there's enough moisture in the soil. And what you do is you do that in several places in your uh, bed, garden bed or container and check it that way. Um, and then you can appropriately water the amount that you need uh, checking the soil. So you have to make sure you check it every day just to make sure that the plants are getting enough uh, water. Um, and then another thing that you need to make sure you do is uh, check under the leaves of your plants once a day to look out for pests. You can sometimes find egg clusters under the leaves. You can pick pe uh, pests by hand. The egg clusters you can literally squish uh, with your fingers as well. When you're doing this too, make sure you're wearing gloves. Um, all right, also uh, you need to watch out for any signs of bacterial or fungal diseases. Uh, if you do see a plant get infected with this, these diseases, uh, the best thing would not, would not, uh, would not, sorry. The best thing to do would uh, 
be to take these infected plants and actually dispose of them. Uh, a lot of people would try to treat them, but from my experience, if you try to treat a plant that has a disease, a lot of times it will spread to other plants pretty rapidly. So it's better to just remove the entire plant or at least the infected part of that plant out and then uh, remove it. But um, most of the time you'll have to remove the entire plant. Um, all right, and then the uh, last thing is using a lightweight row cover to protect your garden from pests. This is again, specifically uh, for cabbage worms. Um, but there are other pests too that could probably go into your garden if you don't use a covered cloth. Um, you can remove the covered cloth uh, before you water. Uh, that's perfectly fine. But making sure that you have a covered cloth throughout the entire day, especially when they're new seedlings uh, early in the winter months, a uh, winter and fall months, um, just to protect them from being devastated from uh, pests. Um, when they do get older, you can definitely remove the lightweight row cover uh, from the garden. That is completely fine. That would uh, make it easier for you to work in the garden as well. Um, but yeah, those are some winter gardening tips. Uh, Riley, do you want to talk about this part? Yes. Awesome. Um, awesome. Thank you, Carla, for sharing all of that expert knowledge. Um, here is a recipe that I whipped up for fall harvest veggie tacos. Um, feel free to take a screenshot or a photo of these ingredients. They're not super specific, but that's how I cook is just throwing stuff in. So sorry for not including measurements of all these um, spices, but yeah, it's um, sweet potato and cauliflower tacos with a cilantro and avocado crema. Um, you can also top it with um, scallions if you're growing those in the winter. And then cilantro, I think, grows pretty well in the winter as well. So that's why I included that. And then sweet potato is just a classic fall vegetable. So if everyone has taken note of these ingredients, I'm going to switch over to the instructions. Um, pretty straightforward, just cooking the sweet potatoes first, adding in the cauliflower next, because um, they don't need to cook as long. Um, and then the star, I think the you can substitute any sort of leafy green that you're growing or that you have on hand just to give a, like a good crunch to the taco. Um, I think kale and sweet potato taste really, really good together personally. So that's what I would use. And I'm growing kale in my garden right now. Um, so that would be my preference, but also purple cabbage is really good on this, I found. Um, and then the cilantro crema is also delicious, super easy to make. You can um, alter the amount of any of these ingredients depending on what taste you like the best. Um, and then, and like I said down here, if you use like a vegan uh, Greek yogurt or sour cream uh, substitute, then this whole recipe is plant-based and vegan friendly. So everyone can take a picture of that if you want to, and I'm sure it'll be included in the video if you want to rewatch it. And that is about all I have um, uh, recipe-wise, but we can go ahead. We have, let's see, a good amount of time left for question and answer. So if I want to welcome y'all to uh, turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves if you're comfortable, or if there's any questions in the chat, we will be happy to answer those to the best of our ability. Oops. So were there any questions? Feel free to put it into the chat as well mm -hmm. if you don't want to go on camera. Uh, anything on winter gardening, anything about cooking your winter vegetables, feel free to ask us questions on that. Actually, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I also have squirrels. Do you have any any mm -hmm. uh, advice on squirrels? Ah, uh, squirrels, uh, the natural enemy of vegetable gardens. <laughs> um, so when it comes to squirrels, uh, usually what you want to do is uh, erect a soft fence around your garden. So what I like doing is getting construction mesh, which are either these orange, black, or green uh, mesh with holes that you can uh, get at places like Home Depot. They're usually really flexible and uh, they come in big rolls. And then if you get garden stakes as well, 
what you can do is you can weave the garden stakes through the holes of the mesh and erect a soft fence around your garden. And that will actually prevent most pests from going into your garden, uh, including some dogs and cats from going into your garden as well. Personally, I, I have a cat at home, so I use a fence to keep her out of the garden so she doesn't use it as a litter box. Mm -hmm. um, the same concept can, uh, the same thing you can do uh, in your garden to prevent the squirrels from going in. But yeah, squirrels are a huge thing. They love to eat your fruits um, way before you do. For some reason, they know when your fruit is ripe before you do. Um, <laughs> but that's always going to be a problem every year, especially for people who live near like oak trees. Uh, there's a lot of squirrels around oak trees. But yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, um, I just want to say thank you again, Carly, Carlo and Riley. Um, and again, for anybody who is here, if you would like to watch this presentation again at a later date, do look for it uh, in the future on the San Jose Public Library's YouTube page. And again, to learn more about La Mesa Verde, just go to their website, uh, which is showing on the screen at the moment, La Mesa Verde shcs.org. Thank you so much. Very informative. And uh, just uh, a little uh, information, we are recruiting, we are still recruiting new families for our 2021 uh, year. So if you want to join La Mesa Verde, please feel free to contact either Riley or me. Our contacts are either by email or by phone number at the bottom of the screen. Uh, let's leave this up just for a minute or so, so that yeah. if anyone wants to write this down, they can. But uh, contact us and, and send us or send us your information, and then we can contact you uh, directly to talk about La Mesa Verde in more detail. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Yanina, for having us. Thank you to all the public libraries. I'm so glad y'all are able to still be open and have programming right now. So that's awesome. Thank you for having us. And yeah, thank Wonderful. you for having us here. Appreciate your being here. Of course. All right. So yeah, we'll just leave this up for a little bit. But thank you, everyone who came. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and do not hesitate to look further um, into our program. Reach out, contact us. I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Awesome.